Andrava. Thank you, Lara. Um, thanks, everybody, and good morning. Um, I'm going to speak about uh, stuff which uh, lots of people have uh, talked about in different ways. And I'm going to cut the problem probably slightly differently from what has been, uh, what has been done uh, to talk about some aspects which are not just common between uh, these two materials, uh, which have become fashionable to discuss uh, because there are lots of new experiments, but to tell, to talk about their connection with some old experiments. And in this talk, I will also use most of the stuff that I will talk about here in relation to uh, these two materials is, is unpublished. Uh, I don't think it's unpublishable, but we'll find out. Uh, I'm going to speak about, uh, my talk will include some work done quite a while ago on quantum criticality. And I will just barely mention a, a paper which uh, I worked very hard uh, with uh, Hide Maibashi in Tokyo, uh, which has just appeared on the archives, which gives the exact solution of the Kubo equation for transport, uh, electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, thermal power, using what I believe are the fluctuations of the quantum XY model. Uh, my interest in twisted bilayer graphene uh, arose uh, after a meeting in Minneapolis uh, and uh, discussions there and waiting at the airport, getting out of Minneapolis with Erasberg and then meeting Mike Zelatel at Berkeley. And my interest in tungsten disalinide was aroused by a a discussion with Liang Fu. So I have organized my my talk around the following question: Why are the quantum critical properties in those, these two materials uh, essentially identical to those in the cuprates, uh, the heavy fermions, and ion-based antiferromagnets, even though the microscopic physics of these materials, each of these materials is quite different. Uh, the parameters in them uh, vary by more than two orders of magnitude from one to the other. Uh, the order parameters are different, but at quantum criticality, uh, most famously, they have a resistivity which is linear in temperature or in magnetic field for magnetic field much larger than uh, temperature. Uh, in the case of the cuprates and the heavy fermions, and to some extent iron-based antiferromagnets, there are a lot more experiments than in tungsten disalinide and twisted bilayer graphene, uh, simply because of availability over the 30-year period of very high quality crystals and armies of uh, experimentalists and uh, theorists to mislead them. Uh, in particular, I want to stress that near quantum criticality in the case of the cuprates and the heavy fermions, uh, the uh, specific heat is T log T. And equivalently, where thermal power is measured, it is T log T. For example, uh, uh, sometimes it's hard to get the specific heat because uh, of uh, superconductivity intervening and not being able to go low enough to the critical point. But when measured, the thermal power is T log T. And I predict that uh, although uh, when thermal power is measured in twisted bilayer graphene and tungsten diselenide, in the regime where the resistivity is linear in T, the thermal power is T log T. Thermal power, uh, unless I'm corrected by the experimentalists here, is easier to measure 
than the specific heat. Uh, when known, the superconductivity, for example, in the cuprates and the heavy fermions, where it's very well known, is definitely D wave superconductivity and uh, uh, trusting um, my experimental friend uh, Ali Yazani, the superconductivity in twisted bilayer graphene appears to be D wave as well. Uh, I think, as far as I know, tungsten diselenide, twisted tungsten diselenide, has not yet appeared as a superconductor. That's what Abhay uh, Pashupati of Columbia tells me. So, the, the, just to give you the final answer to this question, the answer is that they all have quantum transitions, which are described by this statistical mechanical model of quantum XY model coupled in a particular way to fermions. And by particular way, I mean that is how the fluctuations of the quantum XY model are obliged to couple to fermions. So the important part is why are these uh, uh, quantum XY models? So I'm not going to talk about uh, cuprates or heavy fermions or iron compounds. I will simply speak about uh, tungsten diselenide and, uh, and twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, uh, fortunately, the kind of order parameter that is proposed by them is, is not something that I propose. The, the order parameter, I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. But just to show you the quality of the data in the cuprates, these are very recent measurements on crystals of lanthanum cuprate. And you see this linear in P resistivity. And if you reduce the transition temperature, from about 40 Kelvin downwards by applying magnetic field, you can go down to two Kelvin, uh, more or less. Not exactly the same slope, but more or less. Um, and you see that this is a very high quality compound in the sense that the extrapolated resistivity to zero temperature is, uh, is essentially zero. The same thing when you apply a magnetic field, uh, where you, here you have to apply a magnetic field on the scale of uh, uh, 40 to 80 Tesla, which you can do at the magnet lab. And then if, if your temperature is high enough, you find that, uh, uh, for example, here you're looking at the derivative of the resistivity with respect to magnetic field. And uh, that, uh, again, uh, shows, shows you a linear behavior, but very interestingly, I'll come back to it. The derivative of the resistivity with respect to magnetic field has a characteristic uh, temperature dependence, which I will talk about. And uh, contrast this with the uh, experiments by uh, uh, Yaoi and Efetov, uh, this group in Barcelona and now somewhere else, on twisted bilayer graphene. This is the phase diagram that they draw. And at several specific dopings, four in particular, the new equal to minus 1.1, minus 1.6, minus 2, minus 2.8, and 3.2, you see that the resistivity is uh, from about uh, 50 millikelvin to about 10 Kelvin, it's linear in temperature. I understand that not every group has gotten so many different, four different uh, dopings at which the resistivity is linear in temperature, but when they do get it, the slope is similar when they do get it at one or the other. So the results are consistent. You also see that if you depart from there, uh, resistivity approaches T square, here is, you see, uh, this is uh, not too far from, from what you measure there. It's, uh, here is, for example, this one is nu equal to minus 3.7, and this is 3.2, and you see that uh, the resistivity does change. And uh, they have also done experiments in a magnetic field. Uh, very interestingly, the, the uh, region where uh, you find this resistivity is linear, um, 
near there is a region in which there is a phase transition to some unknown symmetries. Uh, and then below this uh, region, there is also superconductivity. Okay. Um, and uh, same thing for uh, twisted tungsten disalinide layer. These are experiments from Pashupati's group at Columbia. And here around some particular doping is the linear interior resistivity. So I'm not going to solve any model. Um, there are lots of people who do that sort of thing not better than me. I'm just going to tell you why, uh, what, for example, Liang Fu told me about tungsten diselenide uh, indicates that it's described by a quantum XY model. Okay? And tungsten diselenide is easier to dis discuss than uh, twisted bilayer graphene which actually will be very similar, but even though the order parameter is quite different. So this is a triangular lattice. And in this triangular lattice, uh, there are these uh, uh, points K and K prime on the Brillouin zone. And I'm told points K and K prime where there are uh, nodes in the dispersion and I'm told that spin orbit scattering is so high that uh, the K point has, let's say, spin pointing up and K prime has spin pointing down. And spin orbit coupling is so strong that you can regard the Z component of spin as a conserved quantity. And if Z component of spin is a conserved quantity, uh, obviously anything that's happening that's interesting, fluctuating, is in the plane. And uh, then I'm told that uh, the most probable expected order is a three sub lattice order of these large semi classical spins lying in the plane and lying, the order expected is at 120 degrees to each other. Okay, so here are three semi classical spin vectors lying in the plane each of them associated with a lattice point. Um, so uh, I will uh, associate A, B, C with the three triangles with which this point is associated and similarly everywhere else. And then the classical Hamiltonian is simply SIA plus SIB plus SIC squared. Uh, let's say S is one, so take out a number minus three. And, and the ground state is SIA plus SIB plus SIC equals zero. These three things are lying at 120 degrees to each other, full symmetry of the lattice. Whereas if in the intermediate state, you have a Cooper fellow, uh, then uh, the same vertex will give you a dominant D wave refraction. And that's very important. That that's what hung me up in the case of cuprates because I knew that the self energy was independent of momentum. So I felt it could not be D wave superconductivity till I realized this coupling. Okay. So now we have to talk a bit about the properties of the quantum XY model. Now, after this, the, the, the quantum XY model with this particular coupling to fermions is as well solved as the classical uh, costless Thales model, okay? And it's soluble. It's, it's a big surprise that there's a quantum model which without doing any one over n expansion, any disorder averaging, any Gaussian approximation is exactly soluble. And it's actually soluble for a simple and good reason. So here is my uh, Hamiltonian. Here are my rotors. Here are my generator of rotations. Uh, this, this is what I've just described. And then I've also described to you this coupling to the fermions, okay? Now, it turns out that this model can be exactly transformed into a model of interacting topological defects, just as Costless uh, and Halos did it for the classical model. But in this case, the, uh, the topological defects are not just uh, 
topological objects in, in space, they're also topological effects in time. And the reason this model becomes soluble is that the topological defects in time and in space are orthogonal variables. So you can solve them by uh, doing the Coslitz tricks twice, okay? I'm not gonna show you the solution. I'm practically gonna show you an experiment, which is that you can do quantum Monte Carlo on this model, and that's just like doing an experiment. Okay, and so this was done again by Li Jun Chu. And what we are gonna, what I'm going to show you is the correlation function e to the i theta x t, x tau e to the i theta zero zero, where x is the two dimensional space variable and tau is the time variable. And one of these i should have a plus sign. Okay, uh, it should be conjugate of each other. And it turns out that this correlation function, the fluctuation regime is uh, identical to the, and this can be analytically shown to the correlation function of the generator of rotations, okay? And here I'm going to show you tau times G theta. So this is very extensive Monte Carlo. The, uh, we had access to a, a computer in Shanghai um, a gigantic computer, and this was done on uh, 200 by 200 by 300 uh, in, in, and, and uh, my young friend Li Jun Chu was extremely obsessive. So we have results for all kinds of things to fourth decimal place, okay? You see, you see this, you're varying something here to get to the critical point. So tau times G theta plotted as a function of tau to the half not tau. As I vary these parameters, uh, you see that it is rapidly decaying and then it becomes constant. You have arrived at the critical point and then it goes up and, and, and becomes constant at uh, large tau. And you can take all these curves and collapse them, thereby getting the correlation length as a function of the parameters, okay? And that's shown here. And with that, what you discover is that this correlation function close to criticality, let's, uh, if you just look at it, it, it looks like one over tau times e to the minus tau over c tau to the half e to the minus x over cx. Now, uh, when one tries to do it analytically in the leading order RG at the level of uh, coslets, uh, I, I can only get uh, an exponent without the half, but I believe this is, a, this is the correct result. It's also a correct result, but it's a bit of a pain because you cannot do with analytic continuation. Okay, you have to do, but at criticality, we agree. And this is a, may I say, it's an extraordinary result, okay? So you are talking about the correlation function, which exactly at criticality are going as one over tau times log of space. So first thing you observe is that the correlation function is of a product form in time and space, okay? This is not what happens when you do the Hertz Moria type models. Uh, the, because of this, everything further is calculable. So the three remarkable features, separable function of space and time. And the other thing you notice is this one over tau. Hey, I can do the analytic continuation of one over tau. It is tangent hyperbolic omega over two t, okay? And, and uh, uh, that is the particular form that my colleagues and I had suggested in 1989 uh, as the phenomenological secret behind the uh, peculiar normal state properties of the cuprate near criticality, okay? So we finally have succeeded in deriving it, okay? Uh, when we wrote that paper in 1989, I got a quick note from Anderson uh, saying, 
would you make me a co-author? Yeah, and I, I have it in the historical record and I didn't reply to it. Yeah, I suffered a lot for it. Uh, now, uh, the spatial length scale that I've already shown you in the previous few graphs, what happened to it? This, this spatial length scale uh, you can prove is the log of the temporal length scale. Okay, so, so essentially the problem is effectively local. The dynamic particle exponent is infinity. Now, given that, uh, you can calculate all kinds of things. Uh, I wasn't smart enough to calculate the conductivity exactly. Uh, this has just been done by. Uh, Hide Maibashi, you could actually, this is the first instance where with any fluctuations, the Kubo equation has been solved exactly. Okay? And uh, what you discover is that Umklapp scattering appears as a necessary vertex correction, which is not one. I used to assume that when the spatial correlation length is essentially local, the Umklapp scattering will give me a factor one. So my previous results are modified by a factor which is in between 0.75 and one. Uh, but at least now we have a, a precise solution of the Kubo equation uh, so that uh, uh, one can have more confidence. And what you find is that resistivity at low T over EF is given by appro appropriate angular average of the single particle scattering rate times the Umklapp factor. The Umklapp factor is between 0.75 and one. We can put limits on it. Okay. Now, uh, uh, let me quickly speak about the resistivity as a function of magnetic field, uh, uh, because that will serve as a. Okay. So, so let's say that I'm doing the single particle self energy, right? The single particle self energy is now this correlation function, which is effectively frequency independent. It has some thermal occupation factor. And then there's a factor which is the amplitude of the fluctuations. Okay. Now, I already told you that there is uh, a conjugate object to it. And if I have to calculate properties which are related to what magnetic field does, I have to find out what is the response. Now, I have a vector field in the problem. So immediately the idea arises, the conjugate object is really a vortex. And those things that I was calling S sub Z, if they are placed locally, they are like vortices because I just can't put them there in the middle of the rest without having char charges flow into it and out of it, okay? The magnetic field is a static object. So the objects that I will generate will be proportional to the real part of the susceptibility. If the imaginary part is going as hyperbolic tangent omega over t, the real part at omega equal to zero goes as log of t, log of omega c, the cutoff in the problem divided by t. And therefore, I will get some scattering from these objects, which will go as the real part. And then just to cut a long discussion short, what one can prove is that the slope as a function of temperature and the magnetic field divided by the slope as a function of temperature will be some factor which depends upon details of the problem times mu bh over kt times log omega c over t. And uh, there were some results on uh, tight binding graphene, uh, which, were, which had already been published by Afetov in his paper as a function of magnetic field. And when I told them about this log, uh, Mr. Yaoyi, uh, replotted the thing as a log. And at all those four compositions, you see this? At these four compositions where there was a linear in T resistivity, there's a linear in H and the coefficient of the linear in H is a log of T. They have no point between two Kelvin and 40 millikelvin. These are experimental issues. You can 
they, they, they do not have a continuous variation of temperature in a large magnetic field. And so this last point is departing, and I have various speculations on why that is. They're only speculations. But over this whole region, you see this. And then you see that the characteristic upper cutoff that you get is on the scale of 50 to 100. When you do the same thing for the cuprates, the characteristic cutoff is about 2,500. Okay, and again, you, you fit the log. Okay, so let me just round up and say that when you begin to get an experimentalist producing results like this, where you are getting agreement of the logs, you have reason to feel a little happy. Okay, so I believe that this problem uh, about uh, um, quantum critical conductivity is a a well solved problem, uh, this linear in T and uh, linear in H. And here are my uh, conclusions. Uh, I've not talked much about, I've not talked at all about superconductivity, but let me just mention that superconductivity is related inevitably to fluctuations which uh, scatter fermions. And I've given you some physical argument of why that particular vertex gives you uh, D wave superconductivity, D-wave in a general sense, it will not depend upon how many pockets you have, stuff like that. And there's this prediction for uh, twisted Brelier graphene and for uh, WSC2 <coughs> that when they measure thermal power, it will be T log T. Thank you. Thank you, Chandra. Is questions, comments? Dissipation kernel, it goes like theta squared. Shouldn't it be periodic in theta? Sorry? The dissipation kernel you mentioned is alpha, yeah. omega times theta squared. Yeah. Why is not periodic in theta? And a second question, why is alpha at the critical point? Let me answer the first question because I haven't yet understood the second question. <laughs> so you are, you are also allowed a function which is one minus cosine of theta, okay? Uh, which would be if the, uh, you, you would think that only the uh, vortex-like objects are dissipating and not the spin wave part of the problem. When, and I cannot solve that problem analytically, but we can do that with quantum Monte Carlo. And that was done, the published result. And what you discover, uh, I, I wish I could give you the physical reason for that. What you discover is that with the one minus cosine theta, the properties remain that of the Galilean invariant 3D X uh, of the 2D X quantum XR model. Omega continues to go as, uh, as K. Okay, so this, even though if I put the, the coefficient of that 10 times the coefficient of the theta square term, the theta square term dominates. Okay, what was your first, uh, second question? Why is alpha at the critical point? Why are you at the critical point? Uh, well, uh, I, I, uh, there are three parameters in the problem, right? Uh, the, 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 the coupling constant to the, sort of like Josephson term, the kinetic energy term, and the alpha, okay? And the critical point is arrived at a particular linear combination of those, okay? Uh, the, the, actually, the phase diagram is more interesting, a little more complicated. I've told you only of one, one object. It is the critical alpha that I have emphasized is going like that, where this is the so-called ordered phase, and this is the disordered phase, and we are doing criticality going in this direction or this direction. So there's a whole line. Uh, yes, there is another question, Andre. Uh, one quick technical question and one more general question. Technical question is this, you showed a bubble and you correctly said that if you have k in the vertices, you have extra two powers of momentum. 
uh, when you calculated current current bubble. But my question is, uh, internal part normally give you Landau dumping, which is omega over Q. Uh, Why not extra one over Q in? Uh... No, the, the 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 answer is no. No Landau, extra one. Landau damping. I, I talked to Landau about it. Uh, only appears for conserved quantities. We are really relaxing the current, and and uh, with with currents. Current is not a conserved quantity at infinitesimal temperature, even in the purest system. And in that case, there is no such thing as Landau damping. Might I say that's omega smart model? No, that, that, that's, that's okay. Uh, it's, let, it's a very popular belief that there should be Landau damping always, but that's not what Landau said. Well, okay. <laughs> uh, more general question is this uh, you said linear and T linear in H. Uh, I'm talking about resistance. Under conditions. Yeah. Do you have the full formula for the scaling function of T over H? Or it's just general statements that in both cases you should get linearity? At, at the moment, I have only uh, li limits on it. Okay. Except that I have a, I've, that the linear in H asymptotically must have this coefficient log T. Uh, if pressed, I can try to calculate uh, calculate uh, the crossover function. They are much harder to do. And hey, I had my 80th birthday in June. It's, it's enough. It's one it's of you the guys, if one of you guys want to do it, wonderful. OK, then now there are more questions from the audience. Otherwise, there are a couple of questions from the chat. Let me go over there. OK, so the first question is, um, can you explain the macroscopic origin of the coupling between XY spin fluctuation and the fermion that you propose in the case of twisted bilayer graphene? Where does this coupling come from macroscopically? And also, I wonder if there has been experimental evidence of the loop current flux state you mentioned in twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, uh, Many the, questions. The, First, what is the origin of this microscopic uh, um, coupling? This is between X, okay. Y spin and let, let me come to the second question. Yeah. But let me clarify is this question in relation to twisted bilayer graphene? Yes. There is experimentally no evidence at the moment. It is just that my very clever friends at Harvard and Berkeley have proposed this order. If it is that order, it is the quantum XY model. If it's the quantum XY model, I have the solution. Uh, for the case of uh, uh, the cube rates, it is loop current, and we have plenty of experimental evidence for that. Uh, for the case of heavy fermions, it's always the, the sort of the spin order in the XY plane. And for critical fluctuation, if I can ignore the fourfold anisotropy, and it turns out that for quantum fluctuations, I can, the fluctuations of the antiferromagnet and of the ferromagnet are identical, even classically, if you are, if you are an XY model. Okay, uh, and the, what was the first question? The first question was, what is the microscopic origin of the coupling to the XY spin and um, fermions in this? In the well, case of twisted bilayer graphene. So uh, <clears throat> this comes to. Can I take a minute on this? Half a minute. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And as I said, somebody fell into the trap, and you guys have to pay the price. Okay. So deriving the fermion collective mode coupling. Okay. So. So we are, we are dealing with problems. Let, let's say I have an XY model, which whether it's for the spins or for the currents, I can represent it as some phase difference, which is occurring on links, okay? And in the case of spin problems, it would be uh, a spin dependent phase difference. Then you see my, and here's, here's the important part. It, it's a kind of gauge theory. The dispersion of the fermions is un, in the presence of a static phi x or phi y changed in this fashion, kx plus phi x. Okay. But we are not interested in the static order, we're interested in the fluctuations. So let me imagine that I am slowly varying this object in space. 
delta phi xr, delta phi yr. Let me further imagine that I have x phi symmetry, although I can do this calculation on the lattice as well. What that means is that uh, this object is independent of rotation in the kx, ky plane if I, if it kx and ky lie on a circle. Then the change of phase with space, delta phi x, delta phi y r is one over the mod of phase and minus phi y phi x times how much I have rotated phase, okay? You, you see the rotation is generating, it's a, it's a, it's a generator of rotations. Now, my effective Hamiltonian, I can take this by differentiating this dispersion with relation with respect to delta theta. So this gamma of k, k plus q is the derivative of epsilon with respect to this, and you get this. And because it's a rotation object, when I take the derivative in the k prime direction, uh, I have a minus sign with a phi y and a plus sign with a kx. What that basically means is that I'm, and, and because of this property, derivative with respect to flux is the same as derivative with respect to momentum, which is a velocity, which is k, and therefore this coupling will immediately give me i k cross k prime. Okay, so that's the magic. This is very simple, and I believe it's crucial in the whole physics. Okay, so a second question is from Pierce. Uh, what does your theory predict for the temperature dependence of the all coefficient? Uh, at the moment, at, at the moment, I've not calculated the the Hall coefficient, uh, and uh, I plan to do that. My young friend Arkady Schechter has just measured the Hall coefficient in the cuprates reliably. Um, I just learned about this last week at Aspen, and I'm planning to to do that. What you observe experimentally is that uh, at high temperatures the Hall coefficient tends to behave as if it's independent of H. Okay. I have to see why that's happening. I, I don't know the answer. And uh, Marco has a question. Maybe you can just switch on the microphone and ask it. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Chandra. Nice to see you. Um, I, I have a question concerning uh, the Z equal infinity transition you find. In some sense, uh, your situation is very close to an extreme case in which uh, Xi, the spatial part, uh, doesn't grow or grows slowly. And then at the same time, the, the time correlations are very long ranged. So uh, I was wondering whether this uh, finding could be made even more radical in the presence of disorder, in the sense that, for instance, you could have that psi <clears throat> doesn't grow at all in space and stays fine. Still, you have a transition which is purely driven in the time axis uh, with the psi tau, which diverges, although psi x still stays fine. This could be tested with Monte Carlo. Did you ever think of this? Um, I, I've thought a bit about uh, disorder and uh, uh, being a, being a uh, practical guy who doesn't like to work much, I look at the experiments first and I find that the uh, slope of the linear in T resistance in the case of cuprates is uh, invariant when I change the uh, residual resistivity by more than a factor of 10. Uh, that discourages me to, uh, to work hard on disorder. Let me also say, which I didn't point out, that you know, Efetov's results looked absolutely beautiful on plotted on a linear scale, but he had carefully subtracted out the background resistance. Okay, and in fact, the background resistance in twisted bilayer graphene in Efetov's data, which I, I believe is the best that has been produced on these problems. The regime in which you see the linear in T resistivity, the variation is similar to the background resistivity in magnitude. Whereas the data that I was showing to you in cuprates, the background resistivity was effectively zero. Uh, so, I, I, so that's why I'm not worried so much about, the, about disorder. Okay, I think that time is running out, so we can thank again uh, Chandra.
for the talk. And the next talk will be. Hello? Okay. 